Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Wilson, and I'm presenting uh, along with Atanas. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, environmentally sustainable AI via PowerWare uh, batch scheduling. So I've been doing this work as an intern with Intel uh, under the leadership of Atanas and Chris Cantalupo. Uh, and I've done this with the support of all of these other people uh, who run the, the GOPM team over at Intel. So uh, let's uh, begin. So for some of the background about why we're looking into this uh, is basically just that AI workloads demand a lot of power. Um, one of the things that you might notice when you look at the different types of things that are happening in these systems is that the overall impact in total of, say, energy consumption will often be pointing at things like inference. However, when you're looking at the, the single run impact of an individual uh, sort of run of doing something with your AI models, it's the, uh, the training side that really has the really heavy impact all at one point in time. So this gives us a big uh, focal point on which we can put our uh, power management decisions to try and have a large impact anyways. So one of the things that we found is this project uh, that uh, I've been working on in my internship, GOPM, uh, where it focuses on power management decisions in HPC systems. A lot of the things that we've been looking at in HPC are also relevant in cloud computing systems, in particular with batch-oriented training in AI models. So one of the key bits that I really want to emphasize to start here is that some workloads use power more effectively than others. The way this is kind of visualized down here on the power cap diagram in the bottom right is that if you have uh, basically a power cap that goes from some high number to some low number, you're going to see that the runtime increases for your applications. Now, the amount that it increases uh, for an individual application is actually application specific. Uh, it depends on the different components you're using with that computing system and how the application uses those different components. Um, so another point here is that there are some estimates that place training a single uh, LLM model uh, ranging from on the order of like 300 to 600,000 tons of uh, CO2. So this energy impact ultimately uh, contributes towards a high carbon impact as well. So these are a lot of motivations we have for uh, investigating how we can use power control to help modulate these systems. So uh, in order to work toward that, uh, we're working for a software stack uh, for Kubernetes um, power management. So we do this by leveraging the resource management features in Q within Kubernetes uh, and utilizing uh, Kubeflow's MPI operator to be able to work with MPI-oriented workloads uh, and using GOPM's software power management framework, where GOPM is this project I've been working on in my internship. So. Uh, one of the questions, or several of the questions that come up through this, uh, uh, the prototype work that we've been doing here is, uh, can we port our solutions for power management to less uh, HPC specific environments, being able to expose ourselves in more uh, cloud oriented environments as well? Uh, some of the relevant bits here are things about like sharing our computation resources uh, and our cloud environments, uh, being able to use edge resources that have cyclic demand, uh, and dealing with things like AI inference computations as well as the AI training computations. Now, the software stacks that we use to achieve this uh, for batch scheduling uh, with, our AI, with AI workloads in Kubernetes uh, include things like being able to distribute training across our uh, AI training uh, computations across a cluster, uh, being able to do internode communication uh, with support for our HPC fabric. Uh, and being able to have these abstract compute engines for uh, highly optimized solutions. Uh, we use several different uh, open source components and plugins for Kubernetes to be able to achieve this. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail about uh, some of the ones we ended up using in some of our uh, test applications here. Uh, so one, one of the other bits that I want to go into a little bit more detail about why it's useful to have power capping uh, in, say, the batch-oriented job scale is because once you do have that sort of control knob where you can modulate power consumption in your job queues, uh, is that it opens you to be able to do additional types of optimizations for your system, uh, for your system's energy usage, uh, where you're routing your power, for example. Uh, the diagram here is illustrating uh, two different types of power uh, distribution policies you might use in your software. 
So again, with, similar to that diagram from a few slides ago, uh, on this uh, bottom axis here, we have a power cap, and on the vertical axis, we have the time to completion. So again, we see as you decrease your power cap, the time increases. Uh, now, uh, the different power management policies we have here are one where you can either balance the amount of time that's spent in your applications, or you can balance the amount of power that you allocate to those applications. Uh, if you do maybe a naive solution where you say, given some amount of cluster-wide power that I have available, I'll just uniformly distribute it across all of my computing infrastructure, then you can see you'll actually run across this point where we have the vertical dashed line, where your different applications are actually encountering different amounts of slowdown. Now, if you somehow have application performance awareness uh, in your power management mechanisms, then you can do something that's actually balancing the slowdown or the time in those applications, where you give different power caps to the different applications in order to achieve uh, uniform slowdown across them. This isn't something we've quite been able to complete implementing in our Kubernetes prototype. Uh, it's something that we've more recently been working on in the eHPC space, but the work that we're presenting here today is uh, a step in the direction of being able to enable this. So the way that we actually end up working toward this for a workflow uh, is that there are basically three steps. The first is that you need to be able to configure your power limits uh, within Kubernetes. Uh, and then you need to be able to model how those different power limits have uh, performance impacts on your applications. Uh, and then lastly, once you do know what you want to set for your power caps, you need to be able to run those applications under some specified cap for power. Uh, so in order to achieve those three different steps, uh, we use Q to be able to configure power limits, uh, where we're introducing uh, a power constraint into the Q system. Uh, and for modeling, uh, we provide some scripts that allow you to run sweeps of your application, executing either the entire application or a representative proxy of the application under multiple power caps, and then feeding the resulting metrics back into a script that we provide to generate the power performance model. And then lastly, uh, we provide a mechanism to actually run your applications under those different power caps, informing the queue scheduler of those power caps and then enforcing those power caps that you've informed queue of. So in order to uh, get to the point where we're able to actually implement all of that, uh, we're utilizing uh, three new features of some open source software in Kubernetes. Uh, one is that we use uh, resource flavor extensions uh, for Q, uh, which through a patch that we provide uh, allows the MPI operator to be able to use uh, power as a first class resource. So we create some devices, uh, some resource devices, and then uh, control those through the Q system. We also utilize sidecar containers, uh, which are a new feature in Kubernetes. Uh, the sidecar containers are useful for us because this gives us a place where our power capping mechanism is able to execute alongside your applications. This power capping mechanism uh, can start when your applications start, and then when your applications end, it can sever a connection with a daemon that we have running, and the daemon will detect the severed connection and restore your old power settings. And then lastly, uh, we're integrating GOPM. Uh, which is a power management, uh, software power management framework uh, for computing systems. And in particular, uh, we just came out with the 3.0 release for GOPM. And on top of that 3.0 release, we've been working on uh, an alpha branch uh, that includes gRPC-based interface, which we utilize in this work. So the, altogether, when we combine all three of these layers, uh, it gives us value in being able to use energy optimization techniques, uh, in our power management decisions. Uh, and it allows us to save energy uh, and make more efficient use of the computing resources that are available to us. I will speak now a little bit about the realization in Kubernetes, uh, how we uh, implemented that uh, kind of approach. Um, just looking into that diagram uh, from right to left, uh, we have a external component uh, inside Kubernetes, uh, the Q uh, engine basically responsible for batch scheduling. And uh, we defined uh, um, a queue for, for a cluster queue, um, which uh, has a specific resource flavor, so called resource flavor in, in Q kind of uh, language. Um, you see it on the picture, we, we call it ito.com power. 
Uh, it allows us to have basically a quota for, for the power across the cluster, across that queue, uh, which jobs can request from. Um, and um, then on the left uh, picture, you see basically what happens um, in terms of uh, pod specs and, and components, uh, which will be which we are uh, creating to, to start an uh, AI training job. So the component on uh, the first box on the right, uh, basically the job, uh, consists of uh, two containers. Uh, we mentioned the sidecar side container, which is actually an init container um, having sidecar properties. Uh, this is a feature which was enabled in Kubernetes 128 uh, where you can define that init container should not block um, your um, uh, following uh, until it's fully executed, but it should be executed in background and then when uh, the main kind of container finishes, the init container is destroyed. And this, this feature was really good for us because we could set the power cap initially and uh, when the application finishes, the training process, uh, the container gets destroyed and this uh, resets the power cap. So basically the node uh, gets back to the original power level. Um, this is our job uh, in the job uh, uh, kind of specification, which is um, following the uh, Kubeflow MPI job kind of format. Uh, we have uh, to request uh, this kind of special resource, the resource limit power. Um, with uh, the um, with some amount of, uh, of uh, power usage uh, which the user can pick. Uh, this is expressed in watts uh, and then passed uh, to uh, uh, a daemon set, which is the daemon set on the bottom um, well, uh, running a device plugin. Uh, the device plugin is responsible really for accounting uh, of these power limits uh, on the nodes and exporting them in an environment variable later uh, to the container so that it can be consumed uh, by the GOPM service. Um, um, and uh, yeah, the last component is the GOPM service, which is really responsible for the execution of this power capping command. Uh, we provide several interfaces to uh, different vendor hardware. Uh, there is one API support for Intel hardware. There is uh, NVIDIA kind of driver support um, uh, for, for basically GPU power control. To illustrate the flow, we have also this kind of cartoon. Uh, let's imagine we have um, uh, the situation where user has a set of jobs, uh, in that case four jobs, and it started, he started, he or she started submitting the jobs. Uh, you see job one, two, and three requesting 1,500, 1,000, and 2,000 watts. Um, and we defined a queue uh, through, through uh, uh, the mechanisms provided by the batch scattering component uh, to, to support up to five kilowatt. Um, and then the user comes with a fourth job requesting 1,500 uh, uh, watts. And basically, this cannot be satisfied at that time. Uh, as we have those three jobs already scheduled on the cluster and being in execution. Um, so the, the four job will be uh, put to idle uh, and we'll wait until some of the jobs freeze resources, freeze power, and will get executed. Um, so in, in terms of uh, what we have uh, uh, as components, we have the TensorFlow jobs executing the AI training. Uh, which request a specific cluster, uh, request a power limit uh, uh, provided by user. Uh, in, in queue, we configured the cluster power limit to five megawatt, and we have the GOPM daemon set. The GOPM daemon set basically receives a command that it has to set the node power limit. Uh, let's, as an example, the 1500 job one, uh, we'll, uh, this, this, when uh, we, we issue that job, uh, this will trigger a command to the GOPM daemon set through a client uh, to request that power limit to be set on the node, and th this will happen basically at, at that, in, in that system. Um, how do we configure uh, the different power limits? Uh, the Q power limit or Q, uh, cluster power limit is a standard kind of uh, resource flavor in Q. 
so uh, you can specify um, different resources uh, in queue, like CPU, power, uh, defining certain quota for them. And you can do that also for any kind of device, um, which is uh, basically exported through a device plugin in Kubernetes. So we use that kind of capability to use device plugins. And we defined the uh, power device plugin, which is really for accounting of this uh, power cap. And you see it's quite simple. Uh, this did not require any change in, in Q uh, way, basically, how to specify it. The job, uh, basically, we took a MPI job coming from, from Kubeflow. And um, yeah, the, in, in that one, we specified the two containers, which I showed in the previous picture. Um, we have an init container, uh, which, which we will be requesting the actual power cap. And um, as it is defined uh, through 1.28 sidecar capabilities, uh, this init container will not block and the actual training container will start. And when it finishes, uh, the init container will be destroyed automatically. Um, yeah, and the actual power cap you can request as part of your resource limits. And resource, yeah, so this is recognized by the device plugin and uh, accounted accordingly. Now I will give back to Daniel to discuss a little bit about the results, what we have. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so this slide is going to go over a specific example of uh, one AI training workload that we tested this out on. Uh, so the point here is that we're able to extract uh, power performance models by using power sweeps uh, with the infrastructure that we've uh, explained over the previous few slides. The plot on the left is showing the results of running a power sweep with an application called Cosmic Tagger. Uh, Cosmic Tagger is uh, uh, an open source uh, application that's able to classify basically uh, background uh, versus foreground um, events in uh, cosmic data or cosmic simulations as well. Uh, we were able to run this inside a containerized environment within Kubernetes uh, alongside this power capping infrastructure uh, that we've explained uh, and took a look at running it under several different GPU power caps. Uh, by utilizing that infrastructure. One of the key bits you can see here is that there's a um, basically a polynomial uh, shaped trend line that's going from the maximum uh, power cap that's available on this four GPU system that we're evaluating here uh, all the way up to the minimum power cap that's available on this system. Uh, in that case, when you're at the minimum power cap, you're seeing around 10% slowdown on average. So what we're able to do then is execute the application uh, under multiple such power caps, which generates uh, a bunch of different log files from our GOPM uh, monitoring container that runs alongside the application. Uh, we can feed those trace files into a modeling uh, script that we also have uh, available here, uh, which generates basically this uh, polynomial model that has our slowdown as a function of a power cap. Uh, basically, the idea is the lower your power cap is, the more your slowdown will be. So let's try and fit that with an uh, ordinary least squares fit. So as a result, once you have this kind of model, the goal is that instead of just blindly saying, every time I submit a training uh, run of this application to the system, let's take this model and say, how, how much tolerance do I have right now based on my work schedule uh, for slowdown of my training once it starts running? In the example that's illustrated here, we've said, well, if the user is willing to tolerate 5% slowdown while their application is uh, running, then we recommend somewhere around an 850 watt uh, power cap on the GPUs. Uh, so this is something that the script we provide um, along here uh, is able to output just by, you know, you put in your 0 0.05 to say I'm willing to take this 5% slowdown, and then it tells you which power cap you want to use. So while we were working on implementing this, uh, we had quite a few things that we learned about how to get it all together uh, and some ideas about ways that it can be extended in future work. One of the things that we thought was really cool is that there's this new sidecars feature in Kubernetes. Uh, so I'll talk about this in a bit more detail on the next slide, but the, the key point here is that by having the sidecar feature, it really simplifies uh, what we have to do inside job wrappers, like the power management layer that we're using. 
What we can see is that Q is able to limit um, continuous resources uh, like power, but it takes some adaptation. Uh, not a lot, but at least some amount, which we were able to implement. Uh, so the way to get this to work is that we need to be able to represent power as some discrete uh, collection of devices. Uh, so this is what Atanas was describing uh, a few slides ago. Basically, you can generate uh, a device uh, as Kubernetes sees uh, devices that you can schedule against uh, for each unit of power that you want to be able to schedule. So if you want to be able to schedule at watt level granularity uh, and your system is capable of taking power caps up to, say, uh, a kilowatt per node, then you would generate 1,000 devices for that node. So then what you can do is, after you've allocated all of those devices, uh, you can request it uh, when you're sub submitting your limits or your requests for your jobs that are going into your queue. So one of the things that we've found is it would be nice uh, if, you could if we could enable uh, continuous resources in some sort of future change. Uh, I don't think we have something in mind yet for how that would work, uh, but it would be excellent to hear if there are any ideas uh, about being able to do this without generating a, a large set of devices. Um, there are also several opportunities to build on this in future work. Uh, so once you have a mechanism, mechanism in place for job level power capping, you can start to explore a lot of things in terms of uh, what are power caps doing to my individual jobs and how can I use those power caps at say a cluster level or some broader level uh, to achieve my other system level uh, infrastructure objectives. Uh, some of the things that we believe you could work on here are doing things like evaluating power over subscription opportunities uh, in your infrastructure. So if you have some level of power over subscription in your system, your goal will basically be to say, with that over subscription in place, I really want to maximize the performance of my system uh, under some power constraints. Uh, so with a power level, uh, or with a job level power cap in, uh, infrastructure that's performance aware, you can make decisions about where you're routing your power within the applications and within the components that they're executing on. And with that information, you can aim to achieve higher system level efficiency uh, because you're able to send less power to the applications that don't need it in order to be able to send more power to the applications that do need it. Another thing we'd love to do in future work is to integrate with container scoped metrics. So as I mentioned at the start of this project, uh, at the start of this presentation is that this project is uh, started as trying to take a uh, power management infrastructure that we've largely developed for HPC systems and start figuring out what sort of new challenges and new solutions are possible in the cloud space. So one of the things that comes from the HPC space is at least for this current iteration of this, we're assuming basically a, a single tenant per node so uh, basically there's always one application executing on a given node because we're controlling power uh, without awareness of what's happening in individual containers that may be executing on the same node. There are other projects out there that have already started investigating this problem. Uh, in particular, the Kepler project is a, a big one where they're working on being able to get container level metrics uh, on power, even though you're typically only able to monitor the hardware at a much broader scale than what's available within containers. So beyond that, it would be great if we could integrate with a solution such as Kepler uh, and further start working toward uh, solutions in per container power control. You'll, uh, we anticipate running into similar challenges for the control side uh, as the types of challenges that are being encountered in the monitoring side, mainly because, uh, for example, if we're only able to set power caps at the individual uh, GPU level or GPU tile or CPU package, you're going to have applications that are executing at a much smaller granularity. Uh, however, there are many other types of power-related controls available in these systems. So similar to what Kepler is doing in terms of modeling those lower-level components to the more broadly uh, package-scoped or GPU-scoped components, it would be great if there's a way we can model uh, the controls as well. Another thing that we'd like to do is to be able to investigate elastic resource allocations. Uh, what I mean by that is basically being able to specify for a job, here's some sort of minimum amount of guarantee of power that we want to give the job based on the user's request, but also that we as the system operators or uh, you know, an automated operator uh, can choose to boost beyond that as needed. Uh, there are a lot of different ways you can apply this. The two examples that I'm most excited about here are things like being able to allow more power during periods of 
low carbon intensity or low energy cost. Um, because basically what you can run into in cases where, say, you have mixes of power availability uh, in the grid that you're, you're working under is that carbon intensity will change over time, energy costs will change over time. So wouldn't it be great if we could take maybe our uh, more efficient applications and give them a little extra power to utilize uh, more of that power at those times of lower cost and lower intensity? Another example is considering that many applications have properties within the applications themselves that change over time. So as applications enter different phases of execution, they may have uh, points where they're more efficient or less efficient with the power that they're using. So one of the things we'd like to be able to do here is introduce the uh, combined solutions that do live monitoring of the performance of the application uh, and live monitoring of the uh, potentially changing power objectives at the system level uh, and combining those to be able to have a system that changes over time. Uh, and comes up with some system level policy that's aware of the application changes as they're occurring. Uh, this is something that we're currently already uh, working on in the HPC space. But again, this is something that I'd love to be able to figure out what the new challenges are in the cloud space so we can uh, bring that here as well. So I mentioned there was something I wanted to say about the sidecar containers. Um, and this slide goes into a, a bit more detail about that. So the, the key bit that was useful for us with this new sidecar feature in Kubernetes is that it simplifies what we can do with job wrappers. And what I mean by a job wrapper in this case is having our monitoring and control that starts with the application and ends with the application. Um, the way that sidecar containers work uh, is that there's some sort of uh, init container uh, that is a prerequisite for the app container. Um, but when the application ends, the sidecar container also ends. So in general, we think this is useful for any type of prologue or epilogue work, uh, which we see quite often in the HPC space uh, when you have batch-oriented workloads. Um, the way that this ends up actually making things more simple is that is illustrated in the example on the bottom here. So when you don't have sidecars, uh, basically what we have to do with our monitoring infrastructure is our container that has the monitoring um, application inside it needs to be aware of what the other container is doing. Uh, in other words, we have to have a shared process namespace uh, and we have to monitor what the, whether the, the process is still alive for the application that we're checking. So we have to know what that application is. On the other hand, if we have sidecars available, uh, what we can do is basically just tell our monitoring application to run infinitely, let it run forever. Uh, and then the Kubernetes infrastructure will uh, terminate it once the application uh, is terminated. Uh, what this allows for us is we can have a more abstract uh, implementation of this because it doesn't need to have any awareness of what the actual application is that's being monitored. Uh, the, with the prototype that we put together, we did have to apply some patches in some of the existing software uh, for the MPI operator or for Q uh, to be able to work alongside sidecars. Uh, otherwise, uh, things just wouldn't start. They'd, be, uh, they'd appear to hang before they were able to actually schedule the jobs. Uh, so one of the things we're hoping we can do is uh, work with those teams to see if there's a way to get official support inside those extensions. So everything that I've been talking about in today's uh, presentation uh, is provided uh, online on our GitHub. Um, there are quite a few places within our uh, GitHub page that it ends up getting used. So we hope that this sitemap might be a helpful way to, uh, to help you navigate where all of this lives. Uh, some of the places I would recommend you definitely check out first are take a look at the GOPM homepage that talks about the power management infrastructure as a whole. Um, take a look at the cloud branch, which contains all of the changes that we made for enabling gRPC uh, with the GOPM infrastructure, uh, and which also, in some subdirectories, contains a specific folder for, uh, for the KubeCon changes. So I'd recommend you change out, check out that directory. There's a readme in there that kind of outlines all of the different components uh, that we were talking about today. And certainly check out the rest as you find they're interested. Those are just some suggested starting points. So uh, in closing, I just want to remind uh, a few points that I've covered throughout this talk. 
Um, the first one is basically that AI workloads demand a lot of power. Um, then that power cap sensitivity for performance changes by workload. So it's important for us to be able to understand for a given workload what's actually going to happen if we apply different power caps. Uh, when you have queue and sidecar containers, it's easy to use uh, GOPM uh, or any other uh, side power manager uh, to be able to use job level power caps. And uh, we have several ideas about future work that should continue making uh, power management broadly available across containerized jobs. Uh, and then lastly, I, I want to mention uh, that uh, I definitely recommend checking out this experimental cloud branch of GOPM, uh, where it provides a gRPC uh, interface to be able to interact with GOPM for power management and accessing its other features. So thank you for listening, and uh, please raise any questions. Hi, Olivier Tardieu, IBM Research. Um, very nice work, very nice talk. Um, we've been exploring very similar things, very similar systems. Uh, so many questions. So maybe just, just one of the first one is, you talked about training jobs, you talked about you know, user tolerance to slowdowns. In our experience, for these kind of jobs, the tolerance to slowdown is zero. Not one, not two, just zero. So do you have any insights on you know, maybe where this is more applicable, uh, you know, GPUs versus CPUs versus, you know, uh, in insights about applicability and what kind of workloads you, you're planning to use this for. Do you want me to I, I can try to answer with some ideas where this can, can fit. Um, for example, I was thinking for ADAS uh, use cases where you have fleet of cars going overnight, um, basically to inject data do, and usually this data is injected in a data center, used in a training kind of uh, uh, training scenario, um, where, um, yeah, the, the new kind of collected data has to be used to refine the models and so on. Uh, usually the, the job has to finish in exactly eight hours, but let's say you have um, different kind of models and they, they finish in different time frame. Some finish in five hours, some finish in three hours. So maybe you can put a slowdown in some of them. You have a total time of eight hours to finish all these jobs uh, and do some sort of bin packing. Uh, basically try uh, allow some sort of uh, slowdown for some of the jobs. Still try to fit in the eight hour time frame. Um, and hopefully this, this will give you a better um, performance per watt kind of ratio for those workloads. This was just one idea where, but maybe Daniel has also some other <laughs> Yeah, I, I think some other uh, things might be that a lot of times users say that they don't tolerate one thing until, say, there's an emergency. Uh, one thing that we've seen in the HPC space is that they've also said similar things, like uh, if you're running this super expensive HPC system, uh, you probably aren't really interested at all in power capping because it could potentially slow something down and your amortized cost of that system is just, you know, being flushed away when you do that. The reality is um, there are all emergencies happen. Uh, sometimes there are budgeting emergencies like in the past year uh, when there have been big spikes in natural gas pricing. Uh, there was a, in particular like one data center that needed to shut down about a third of their systems for about a quarter of the year in order to meet their energy budget. So when you have systems that cannot tolerate any slowdown, but they actually hit some other constraint that reveal, reveals, you know, actually we can tolerate running at a lower level, you're going to have users that start being a little bit more realistic, saying, you know what, maybe I am willing to accept 2% slowdown instead of saying zero all the time until there's an emergency where I don't get to run at all. Um, one of the things that we expect, if you can tolerate very small amounts, like between zero and 5%, is that there still are several opportunities you can get there for energy savings. Um, these plots here show someone else's work uh, on the left uh, where they were evaluating uh, LLMs with GPU power caps, basically demonstrating similar uh, to what we saw in our curves, where at subtle power caps, you have uh, basically a slight amount of uh, increased time, but you do get savings for your energy. So what we expect you might be able to do is if you see systems where you start charging users for energy-related concepts, uh, they might be also more incentivized to take very slight slowdowns in order to save energy. Um, hi. 
Thank you for your uh, presentation. It's really good. Uh, I have a question about the internals about the GOPM. So how does it really uh, control the power consumption? Like what device can it control, like CPU or memory or NIC device or PCIe device? How does that really work? So for the data that we showed on the, the curve in these slides, for those, we were just doing GPU power caps. Uh, we were interacting with the NVML software library to achieve that. Uh, this, the GOPM software is capable of also uh, utilizing, uh, say, MSRs to be able to interact with GPUs for, uh, or sorry, CPUs for their power caps. Uh, we can do uh, DRAM power caps through Rappel in that same interface as well. Uh, so for that, we either directly interact with like the MSR driver in Linux or the MSR safe driver. Um, for, which provides a batch interface. So in summary, it's uh, GPU, CPU, and uh, DRAM. Yeah, and the, and the DRAM uh, comes through the, the Rappel software power management interface for us. Okay, thank you. Hi. Um, you mentioned one of the future directions is about finer granularity and like uh, power management for containers at the container level. So I was wondering how would, how would that control at the container level uh, theoretically work? Would, would that have to be through, through like the kernel itself and C groups? Yeah, so one of the ways that I imagine that could potentially be possible is uh, basically yeah, in integrating with something at the kernel level. I don't think there's currently support to say like doing specific power capping policies on a per process level, uh, but if you can integrate with scheduler events, uh, then there may be opportunities to basically model not necessarily directly a power cap, but other power controls to power consumption. For example, uh, on systems where you can only do like package level power capping, uh, you may be able to do core level frequency limiting, uh, which you can use with power performance models to basically create your own software power capping uh, infrastructure. A challenge there will be that there are uh, latencies associated with changing uh, the frequency limits. So it would probably require something a bit more involved uh, to integrate with the Linux scheduler to, so that can try and uh, you know, batch things together uh, and avoid frequency state changes if that's not actually what you want at that point in time. My opinion is that uh, it's possible to get something that's more control than we have right now. Uh, it may be difficult to, you know, get ideal control. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all.